Hello, and welcome back to another week of the DP World Tour Picks and Bets. Skylar Hoke joined, as always, with my man Tom Jacobs. Tom, how are we doing today? Good. Yeah, really well. Thank you, Sky, and I hope you are too. Um, I feel like we had chances last week and we're just kind of lit down, right? And um, Pierre Gard certainly finding his game again, right? He, he's in a great spot. Uh, just looks a little bit fragile over the weekend. I think the kind of culmination of when you've had a couple of weeks of playing well, maybe the expectations changed slightly, you put a bit much pressure on yourself, and that certainly showed. And Manasera just started too slow, and and as we've kind of been talking off air before we come on, like just still missing those putts that are his Achilles heel, right? So wasn't able to kind of take advantage of another really good iron week. So other than that, like pretty happy with the process after a couple of weeks off again, um, and and happy to move on and, and try and find another winner here in the uh, Cranser Sierra. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think it was a, a week of what ifs too. You know. I, Personally, I was never getting a Norgard Moeller at, at the Belfry, you know, just did not seem to fit the the prototypical type of game he has. But Thriston Lawrence made every sense in the world um, and, and gave it a good run. Um, somebody who were on this week uh, or, uh, that I'm very interested in um, played well last week. Andrew Wilson makes makes some sense there and, and played awesome. And then Minasaro for us, like exactly right. I think um, he continues now probably repriced to the to the better spot in the market this week to what he needs to be to make me um, not as comfortable with the click but yeah overall a good week and then i think the other uh one too is jesper svensson just continues to elevate himself into basically a pga tour player right he's going to be a pga tour player at this point seems if he continues a year uh this way so um I think it's good just to get back in the swing, a better uh, event even this week with the Omega European Masters. DraftKings does have a recording on Tuesday now. It's two contests up for the week with 20K to first in both of those. So about, you know, five to 10 times bigger than what we typically get on the DP World Tour as we're in the limelight for this week. And then also for Wentworth in a couple of weeks will be the only show in town for that week. There's no PGA Golf in between that one. So excited for that one also, hopefully to get some larger prize pools on DraftKings. So because of that, we're going to go with a format of running through salary ranges and then giving our picks there just to give people a little bit more context to the slate upcoming here. So I guess we can kick off first by Cran Soussier, best views on the, on the DP world tour, amazing mountains in the Swiss Alps. Um, any thoughts on the course fit overall, Tom, and kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, just, just quickly before I dive into that, just a couple of things that you sort of picked up on there. Like, I guess Norgard was the course play in the sense of, like, he'd finished seventh there last year. You don't necessarily know that's, like, an overachievement based on that's not really the kind of skill set you go for. As you said, wasn't necessarily playing in the best golf. So a really hard pick on that. Thriston Lawrence and Jesper Henson both continue to play really good golf, as you mentioned. Both of them now second and third, respectively. Um, in the rankings. The one question I had for you, Sky, before we move on, Nicholas Norgard hasn't got the PJ Tour ranking next to him on the race to Dubai, and I don't know why. I still can't figure out why. So you've got Thriston Norrick, Jesper Svensson, Sebastian Soderberg, Rakoya Hoshino, Lane Gass, Rasmus Hoygaard, Matteo Minasari, Frederick Lacroix, and Laurie Cantor. But it skips Norgard, who's in sixth, and I, he's not already got the PJ Tour run, right? So I don't know why he's not got that next to him. I don't know they've changed the criteria slightly this year and you have to have played a you know, certain event or whatever or the swing, but I don't know. I think they're just missing it because I count it and they I only count nine. You so know, he, so they've just not put the logo next to it. And so. it could be with like the name difference or something sometimes. Uh, but yeah, he's gotta be the the third one on that list um that for good. that. Yeah, you've done the, the smart thing, you just count them up. So in that case, then, Cantor is kind of hanging on to that 10th spot ahead of Guido, Guido. McCarthy, ahead of mm-hmm. Tom Cuban, who everyone's been talking about a lot this season. How does it work? I'm guessing it's just not eligible. Because Joaquin Neiman's 19th, he's just, he's just not allowed to have it? I would assume that, but then you look at Laurie Cantor, right? I mean, not that he's a full-time live player, but he's definitely teed it up on live this year, right? Or last year. Um, so interesting. Um, I don't think they would let Neiman have it. No, no. because like, I guess some of these players are playing that hasn't played last week. I think probably going to play Wentworth or Ra maybe as well. So, 
Um, just just another little sort of layer there. But I think before we go into the event, like I thought it was just worth mentioning those players that are, are sort of on the track to be a PGA Tour member. Like Manacero has gone from Alps Tour to Challenge Tour to DP World Tour to PGA Tour potentially in the space of a few years. So it's been a real remarkable comeback. Um, still think people are sleeping slightly on, on what Manacero is coming back to doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the crew. It's it's a little bit more eclectic than um, yeah. you know most years, at least at this point uh, that we that we see. I mean, and a, a lot of movement can can still happen. I mean, but I guess we'll just transition because a lot, of, almost every yeah. single one of these guys is playing this week, and we we can talk to them a little bit more in, in this range because the first range is top of the odds board. Clearly, Matt Fitzpatrick, two-time winner here, a couple other top fives, uh, 10,900 in DraftKings, followed in by Rasmus, Matt Wallace, and Bern Wiesberger are the 10K and above guys. Um, I guess first off the bat, to me, I assume this would be a week, especially because there's a separation in the market that Fitz would be an overwhelming great click, best play on the board, because that's just what I'm so used to in PGA DFS right now. Yeah. But I think with the pricing and even the uncomfortability a little bit more in the 6Ks, I'm okay with being lower on average to fits, at least right now, and pretty intrigued at, at Rasmus at, at a $500 discount of anybody in this range. Do you have a favorite? Yeah, so very simply, I'm taking on Matt Fitzpatrick with Rasmus Hoygaard. Now, Fitz has got two wins, a second, a third, and a seventh here, in, and that's against one miscut and a 69th. Rasmus Hoygaard won here on debut and has then missed two cuts since. Now, obviously a little bit more volatile, Rasmus, but I think both of them, go back to that course fit that you mentioned before I sort of cut you off there, um, both of them kind of play into exactly what it would crown Sierra. I can get really hot with their irons, can get streaky with the butter. Um, the, the older version of Fitz that was winning here didn't rely on a, a long driver. Rasmus doesn't either. Um, you can certainly get it out of there. Both of them can now, but... Um, just just the trademark thing is to get really hot with your irons here at uh, Grand Sociere. And I just don't think there's that much of a difference in between them at the moment. Now, had this have been six to eight months ago, people would still be wondering whether Fitz is just going through a bad patch or whatever. I think it's fundamentally Fitz has just not had a very good season. Um, I, th- I think I'm okay and comfortable saying that, right? Like, it's just been underwhelming this year, whereas we thought, when he'd kind of find the extra layer of his game with with the driver that he would kick on. I mean, look, you know, he's been fifth in the players, fifth in the Memorial, tenth in the Valero. Like, are we holding him to a, a really high standard? Yes, but that was that's what we've come to expect, right? You look at his kind of finishes really this season, a lot of it's been putter driven. He did he did hit the irons pretty well at the players, but other than that, his irons have been pretty poor. Um the driver's been okay apart from the last few weeks. So I just don't think he's the player that he was when he was first winning here. Um, Not in terms of profile and and ability and things like that, but just like he's changed his game slightly and um, just seems to have lost his irons in recent weeks, whereas Rasmus is is playing really well. And I know this is a full 360 to to what I said last week where I felt like he couldn't get through four rounds, but it really showed me that he actually played a different way this last past week um, where he started slowly and kind of grew into the event and played really well on the final day and, Look, you could argue, look, he's come really fast on Sunday and not much else. But um, I think he, the way he grew into that event, a little bit like Manacero, um, is better than what he'd done in the past where he'd been first and second after round one and, and fell away. So I feel very confident about Rasmus Oigard over Matt Fitzpatrick this week. Yeah, I mean, I side with you. Maybe the field ends up being a little bit scared of Fitzy, which then could be an opportunity, right? I think ownership projections in the European DFS side of things is kind of the wild, wild west at times. <laughs> so as much as we can get a pulse on that, we'll try. Um, but we saw a similar price situation with honestly probably more interest from from the majority last week with Tyrrell Hatton in the exact same spot. Yeah. Thought he was going to run away with the event after 36 holes, the way he was hitting the ball and to fall off like he did. I mean, it's still big expectations when you are priced at this number and probably with a worse season, Fitzpatrick is priced in the exact same spot, you know? Yeah. And, and I think it could just, you know, to that point, I think it's a really good comparison because I think Fitz could just do exactly what Hudson did last week. Like gets off to a, you know, a hot start. He's, you know, he's a two time winner here, three times or four times inside the top three. Um, and and just better than everybody in the field, generally speaking. But I do think that the Saturday and Sunday will catch up with him. You know, don't forget that he played well here 
last year and then got beat by Aberg and Alexander Bjorn, right? So um, I, I don't think he's unbeatable by any means. And the price suggests you have to feel close to that, um, especially when you've got talented players like Matt Wallace, Bernd Wiesberger, Tristan Lawrence, Eric Van Roy, and Nikolai Hoygaard waiting in the wings. I, I imagine Tristan Lawrence is going to be a pretty popular play. Right. So if we just go into the next, like I would say Wallace is also intriguing to me up there versus kind of the others, despite the way he hits the ball and the way he gets run. He just, he just does it and finds a way. I mean, he lost in the playoff to Thriston Lawrence two years ago at this event, which was kind of a big, a big pillow fight at that point um, that year. But um, yeah, Thriston Lawrence is 9,800 and you go all the way down to Guido in the nine K's. Um, where it's filled with the other Hoygaard, EVR, Soderberg, Manasaro, and Cantor in the nine case. Yes, I think off the top, Thriston, probably deserving, so, deservingly so, will be the most owned player on the slate, if I had to guess. Playing awesome. Open Championship was great. One on the Sunshine Tour. One here before. Like, there's not much you can pick apart um, on Thriston. And, you know, you get him now just below 10 K. So I think it's just more intriguing to the eyes at that point too. So do you like him the most of the guys in this range, or are you willing to take more of a shots on Nikolai or EVR, uh, Cantor, anybody in this range that you would be, be of the likes to. I, th- I think I would take EVR. I, I've been really high on him throughout the PJ tour season. He he's played really well. He's obviously got that win at the end, tail end of last year, then contended a couple of times again this year. Uh, has faded off slightly, but when you look at what he's done here on, in three starts, he's been 35th, 12th, and then the best finished eighth last year. He's been in the mix multiple times here, like you know, inside the top 10, going into the weekends and things like that. So I think just from a standpoint of how do we translate PJ Tour form into DP World Tour starts? I think he'll really impress. He did he did really well, didn't he? At the Scottish Open before fading away as well. Just similar to that. So I think there's a real high upside on him. I guess the really intriguing one, look, everyone knows what they're going to get out of Lawrence. They're going to get out or think they know what they're going to get out of Lawrence and Manacero. Nikolai is going to get his you know plays because people know him. I think the real question, one is whether Bernd Wiesberger people get a little bit shocked by the 10K and don't play him. And I think that's an interesting one because I think I would play him. And the other one is, what do we do with Sebastian Soderbergh? So that was the one that I waited to go through line by line on the race to Dubai because as of now, he has a PGA Tour card, you know, like which is insane because we have not seen him since blowing the lead on Sunday at the Scandinavian. I guess we saw him once and he withdrew halfway through the first round. Last time he's played, he's withdrawn pre-tournament a couple other times. I don't know if there's an official injury sighting or if it is, you know, strokes gain mental type of yeah. thing where, I mean, he had to be beside himself, you know, and Lynn Grant obviously took that trophy with like disgust because it felt like such an awkward situation. Do we think enough time has passed that we feel confident? I don't even know if you can think he's going to play four rounds. Well, like, I think, I think the telling thing is, and this is no good to you from a drafting standpoint unless you're willing to just take the shot. If the guy is playing exactly the way, actually better than what Alexander Bjork was playing last year, and he came into this perfect course for him, finished second, and for all intents and purposes, had a really good chance to win outside of moving Aberg. Soderberg, the only event that he's won on the DP World Tour, I believe, uh, he beat Roy McIlroy in that playoff at this golf course. So if he's ever going to kind of heal, you would think it's going to be at this golf course. There is... Something about the way he was playing all season that suggests he'd taken another level and, and taken a step up in his game. The irons were unbelievable. Um, it's just the fact that he has entered those couple of tournaments and pulled out. And if I knew, if I if I had any intel that he was going to play four rounds and he'd, he'd kind of put it behind him and, you know, it'd been a long enough time, I would take the chance. But uh, it's so risky. I'd rather bet him, I think, and just take a shot and just hope for the best because or bet him in play if he gets through the first round. So back ribs is what it's listed as, as an injury. Now, in fairness, looking through, finding a random tweet on the internet here from at Dan, the golfer 79 in Majorca this week for the Srixon sales conference this evening, got to watch Sebastian Soderbergh stripe a few. And then tomorrow we get to see next year's toys. So meaning for he's a Srixon, you know, uh, sponsor or golfer. So health 
I don't know. Like, I mean, I can watch a video of Soderbergh teeing it up here and, and look like, you know, a stripe show like he normally does. The If I'm going like three levels too deep on this, because, you know, I've been playing PGA DFS for a while and kind of have a feel of it. I'm not sure the normal person who's playing this tournament is aware yeah. of what Soderbergh is going through right now. Yeah. So then my fear is you just look at a box score and it seems like the perfect play at a great price at the last exactly. history. Why wouldn't you play him? So if that's the case, I would rather be off. I'd rather take him to the shot like we did at the PGA Championship or the U.S. Open, whichever one he had that hole-in-one in and played so well at, you yeah. know, when no one knows him and is on him versus maybe casual is playing for the first time and seeing somebody who's had the season he has. Yeah, like the appeal in this situation normally, as we've sort of, and you put it so succinctly there, is you're taking a shot and and you're going to be in a low ownership is is the only sort of but as you say if people are just new to this week and they're just looking for a golfer they've got a golfer that's one on the golf course and he's got what four top three finishes in the last five starts they could easily just go well you know there's not been that many dp world tour events let's just give him a pass he's right up here in the race of the bar he's gonna have a pj tour card so i think you're right i think the the answer is don't play him um, but it's certainly the most intriguing question because I think everyone else in this range is kind of a much for muchness. I think I think Lawrence is obviously the form horse, but the others are all as talented. Um, I don't really know what to do with Laurie Cantor. I've kind of given up trying to predict that. But yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. I, I just think that's an interesting angle to like think through that. But if I if I zoomed out, I mean, I think my favorite two plays. I'm not going to get off the Italian stallion drain of of not playing Manasaro and, and Guido. Last year, Guido, not in the similar form to what he was, shot a 62, I think, on, on Saturday, and then a 63 on Sunday. Uh, mixed it in with, like, 74s to finish, uh, you know, not the best. But I, I will pass. I mean, Guido, I mean, he's probably like a golfer who's a little bit, you know, mental of how he's playing, and then he is. I mean, he was inside the top 10 going into 18 on Thursday, quadruple bogeyed Thursday, the final hole pretty much would have had a battle to make the cut, um, you know, and get through and, and just didn't have it with the irons. But majority of those strokes were lost on one hole, hit it great off the tee, just didn't putt well. I, I am totally fine to rinse and repeat with Guido. Um, the problem is, Tom, and maybe I'm taking too much credit, but at this point we have built such a persona with Guido up that he often becomes the most popular golfer because it's a chance to click in with, with bigger money on the line. So Guido is not going to sneak by despite a miscut. Yeah. And I think, I think, but one thing, and, and that's the concern, right? Is that like Guido's not going to you know sneak by because he's a popular name. There was a certain affinity to him. So you're not getting that ownership of like discount of, Oh, he's coming off a miscut. Let's take a shot. The same applies to Soderbergh. So they're almost not winning here in any way, shape or form. It's like a, it's like a casuals dream. This is the perfect field for casuals. Manastero is a name that people still will remember from 10 years ago and, and come back and go, right, he's playing well again. Like, um, I, I think Manastero is a better DraftKings player than he is a bet at this point. Um, I've been betting him for a little while now. Um, on the betting side of things, just to go back, just to make it clear, I am betting Rasmus Hoygaard at 18 to 1. So, favorite player, DraftKings, favorite play um, on the betting board at 18 to 1 there. Um, I think it's all, I think you just, there's two ways of approaching it. You either take Rasmus and then start filtering down to the kind of high eights, I think, or you take two of these guys and, and just, yeah. you, you do what you do. Talk, what I, I played a lot of stars and scrubs, heavy type of builds on the PGA tour. Cause the top of the field has been so good. There is not that separation despite liking no. Rasmus this week where you could skip the 10 Ks completely very easily. You could be starting lineups with Manasaro, honestly. Manasaro Guido, I think, is a very fair start and not even have to dip really below like 7,500. So I think there's a different way to approach this in your typical week. Um, and you could go, you know, the 10 K heavy type of route, like we mentioned, and then skip the range. But I, I don't know. I think uh, I think Cantor probably is the best, best contrarian play for me yeah. in the range because i just i just doubt people feel comfortable with him um played well as one time here hit the ball great and just showing signs of life and i mean very well could be on the way to the pga tour where i think he could be very good on the pga tour 
Yeah, I do. I think we've sort of said this when he got his win, like his perfect profile for it. I think you're right. I think a lot of people don't really know Glory Kansas still. Like, especially people that don't like Liv, they're not going to pay attention to the fact he was playing over there. Um, you know, it's quite easy to miss the fact that he'd won on the DP World Tour. It was in amongst a good run for the PJ Tour. So, um, yeah, I, I think he is definitely the, the difference maker. Uh, there is so many players in this high eights that are appealing that it makes it so hard to just take that one shot at the top, despite obviously liking Rasmus. Right, right. I, I, I don't I don't disagree. And if we just roll right into the 8Ks, I mean, yep. a, a larger range every single time. You and I align on our first selection. Here's where I'm starting my betting card for the week, and it's Alex Fitzpatrick. Not Matthew, Alex Fitzpatrick, who finished fifth here last year on debut. I think we picked Alex as our sleeper to have a, a PGA Tour card, you know, in this coming yep. year. Unfortunately, it's not came through to that degree. However, he still does have, I think it's like eight top 20s on the year, three top 10s, including um, a T6 at the Czech Masters was T12 last week. If he had any bit of irons, he would have had that. And overall, that's not the most of his game so far that we have seen. We've kind of, again, this this putting and maybe a little bit of off the tee pro- progress built around accuracy, which again, at, at high elevation, he's not going to have to bomb it around um, at this course. So last year he was pretty brutal actually off the tee and still managed that top five. Just feels he's checking a lot of boxes of incoming form um, for me overall and feel like you know, he opened with a 74, closed with a 68 last week to get to T12. I just feel like he, he has that ceiling. Just we've seen it on the Challenge Tour uh, in 2023, getting his card quite quickly where he can win a big time event. And I think this could be a nice kickoff for him. Yeah, look, the, the, the very lazy thing to say is he's going to play practice rounds with his mm-hmm. brother who's won twice and got four top threes here. And that's only going to benefit him. The other lazy thing is that he's finished fifth, right? And that's. But, I mean, I think we backed him last year. I'm pretty sure I did. I think we uh, did, yes. Yeah, like, we bet him last year, and, and he didn't quite get the job done. But he looked he looked comfortable for a lot of part of it. He looked like he could win it. Um, my only reservation about Alex Fitzpatrick, and it is only one, is that his iron play hasn't been great. Like, he was decent at the Czech Masters, but otherwise it's been pretty poor. Now, the one thing I would say that points to is that his finishes, he's still got, what, like three top 12s in the last... What is that, like eight starts? Um, there's just a flaw to his game as well. You talk about the, the high ceiling, but I think he's just such an established player so quickly. Now, he's only 25 years old, Sky. And I was putting it like, because Matt was winning at kind of like 2021 20, on the DP World Tour, he was kind of touted as a star before he was one, very quickly made a transition to the PJ Tour. I think I feel like there's just this assumption Alex Fitzpatrick was just getting nowhere near him in terms of quality. Now, I'm not one to sit here and say that I think Alex Fitzpatrick is a future major winner and he's going to go and be top 10 in the world. But I, I just wonder what the gap is going to look like between the two players when it's all said and done. Now, I don't know what success looks like. If Alex Fitzpatrick becomes a Matt Wallace who's won three or four times on the DP World Tour and can contend and win on the PJ Tour once in the blue moon, plays the Valspar well, something like that. That's still a hugely successful career. And it's just very unfortunate he's going to be compared against his brother. I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. And if that's the sort of player we're talking about, then at 40 to 1 on the DP World Tour, out of course he's finished fifth out last year, after he's coming in at the sixth and twelfth, it seems like a no-brainer. And as you said, we did predict him as a sleeper to have that PJ Tour card. And whilst he hasn't got it yet, Norgard made a 30-place move in the rankings last week with a win. If if Fitzpatrick does that, then he's he's getting a card or he's in position to get a card. Yeah, 100%. A lot can still shake out um, for this, this shorter time period that we have. Um, the rest of the 8Ks here, Jesper Svensson, who we talked about, I mean, priced appropriately, might not have all the interest debut here, what, coming off a fifth and a second. I mean, he just spikes. I think that's what he's done enough. I mean, he has five top fives on the season mixed with, I think, five missed cuts on DP World Tour events, but no other finishes inside the top five, only eight top 20s. So when he's in it, he's in it. Um, And 
potentially might get over-owned to me relative to some of the guys around him that I like a little bit more, like a Jorge Campillo, who now getting over here, we see him um, fl- flourish again. Again, I thought he was pretty underrated and sneaky good on the PGA Tour this year. To then come into this field to be priced at 8700 to me, I have a lot of interest um, there. He would be my my pick, probably over Langosk, um, Langoske. I mean, it feels cheap for Jordan Smith in eighty at eighty four hundred. Matthew Jordan, I thought had a pretty awesome year, obviously with the Open Championship. Any any thoughts from you in the eight Ks? Yes, yeah, so I think you've, you've probably assessed Spence and not done that necessarily right, but in the same way that I have, in the sense that I couldn't quite get to the betting card. I didn't believe that. It's going to continue. And the reason behind that is he's just done it in two separate ways. He done it all off the tee that Chet Miles has finished second. And then it all basically putting last week. He did he did hit the driver well as well. But that's not going to be enough here. He's going to need to be re- razor shot of his irons and and he just hasn't had that yet. So that would be the the negative to Yes Fence. And I agree with Campio. I do understand that he's been pretty underrated when he's come back and played in the DP World Tour. He's looked pretty good. He's got that fourth at the Myrtle Beach uh, on the PGA Tour early in the season, fifth at the Qatar Masters, sixth obviously last week, and and gained in three of the four categories. I think that's huge. You know, it's not every time you can gain with around the green stuff. So absolutely fine with that. He's got the fourth place finish at the course. Very volatile, I would say, at the golf course is the one concern, but um, he's got the fourth. I think Jordan's really steady. Uh, I remember him playing really well here on Matthew Dave. Jordan, you're saying, not Jordan, Matthew Jordan, right? Sorry, yeah. yes. Uh, Matthew Jordan, 8,500. Third, like he was fifth after round two, third going into Sunday, finished fourth. I thought that was really consistent of him. And then even when he followed that up, he finished 44th, but he had a second round 67, final round 66. So I think that's really solid at the course. And and when you look at his form, as you said, it, it spikes obviously at the Open Championship. But that's the second time now he's done well in the Open. Everyone kind of looked at it and went, look, this is just what he does because he's at home. No, follows it back up with a tied 10. Um, he before you go on, yeah. Lynx Golf, like he's now the number one player that I, I think about in Lynx Golf because he's done it now a lot. Yeah, and look, the, the argument would be, is he going to do that? But when you look at his form, fifth at the Sedal Open, thirteenth at the European Open, twelfth at the Scandi Mix, twenty fifth at the Scottish Open, uh, twenty sixth. Sorry, just really consistent. I know the last couple of weeks haven't been exactly what he wanted, but. There's a there's a period of time where he's getting over the open, getting himself back in the mix. Um, I, I think he I think he looks really good, Matthew Jordan. So, and we uh, don't I have think, to bet on him to win either. Like I don't yeah. really trust him to win, but to pay off eighty five hundred dollars, I think he can do absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I would pick him out of those three of Jesper Svensson, Jorge Campillo, um, and probably uh, Langask is a different question, but I probably can't get there either on him. Um. I will say buyer beware on Ewan Ferguson. Um, another one who, if you've kind of read some of the tea leaves, he recently recently withdrew from an event. He's having vertigo issues. Um, it first started at the European Open um, in June where he had to withdraw for the first event and hasn't been able to really assess it. He did win an event after getting the diagnosis and really not even playing like himself, but then popped up again. He withdrew um, in check the week before after not feeling comfortable and then said things arose again early on last week, played but missed the cut. So I think Ewan, similar to, to Soderberg, just comes with the profile of people are comfortable with him, have seen him do well when they played him in spots as a good box score. I am probably leaning on the side of avoiding because I think there's too much to be worried about and the health side of things. So that's a sneaky one there. I don't think you want to be in the Alps when you've got Vertigo either, right? Like I would, I would assume not. No, I, I and that's, that sounds like I'm taking a bit of a cheap shot, but like I'm genuinely serious. Like I, I feel like that's probably the worst place he could possibly be. And I imagine that the, the only thing I would say is that he might figure it out today and tomorrow. <laughs> like he might correct, just, correct. And just put it out beforehand. Um, yeah. It seems strange that he's kind of forcing it a little bit. Is there, but he's probably is, in a spot. What, I mean, what's he on the rankings? Yeah, I guess twenty third. What he has a card. He, he's he's pushing for that. But is he pushing for that PJ Tour card? Right. Yeah. I mean, he probably just knows he can't really miss too much. Um, of the other guys in the eight Ks, I mean, it's cool to see. Uh, I mean, I think he played last or two weeks ago. His and missed the cut. 
But yeah. I still think Rio has like he's somebody I would be interested in these 8Ks. Has a sky high ceiling, does it with hot irons and a really hot putter. You know, didn't really come to fruition on the PGA tour tour this year. I mean, he had the T3 at the Wyndham, but he was awesome last year on, on the, the DP World Tour, 13th on debut here last year. He's somebody that a good I'm almost intrigued at betting him now that I think about this. What are, what are your thoughts on his tune? Uh, just hard to get right, I think. Um, I don't know, that's kind of sitting on the fence. I think the upside is, look, he finished third at the Wyndham Championship amongst the PGA Tour field. The downside is he's finished, you know, he's missed four out of the last five cuts. And I know they're, they're coming in events that, you know, the Scottish Open. And when, when it's the Scottish Open in the Open, I'm fine with that. When it's shooting 82 at the 3M Open and then missing the cut at the Checkmasters, the week after finishing third, I'm a bit concerned. But he still striped the ball at the Czech well, Masters, though. And it's a lot of back and forth, isn't it? Like he just doesn't strike me as a player that's going to cope with his back and forth. And and when you look at the fact that he finished 13th last year, he might just be grateful for just being back in the the deep world tour swing of things. And he was really good here. He got better throughout the week. 268 to open, 65, 66 over the weekend. That probably lines up to be like the perfect DraftKings play. Like he's forty yeah. to one in this range. I, I I feel more confident and consistent of Alex Fitzpatrick than him, but at a DraftKings upside where you know the floor is missing the cut, like yeah. I, I think in tournaments, like that's that's the the perfect style. You also get safe Connor Syme and Use Luton kind of priced around them. Going to hit yeah. the fairways, going to hit greens, going to play well, pretty well here. So I think again that balanced strategy where you do kind of load up in this range is it, probably pretty prevalent. I, I was going to say I quite like Syme. Uh, I think he's playing strongly now, and and he's he went through that little lull, didn't he? And he's had a couple of miscuts the first two times here, but then finished third last year second going into the final round we know he has a little bit of a winning problem but just seems to be finding a little you know a bit more consistency now in his game again 34th um at the Sadao open but he was seventh going into friday 22nd european open fourth at the bmw international open 15th again at the scottish open really good result in that kind of field seventh going into the weekend at the czech masters still 12th going into sunday and then a little bit disappointing last week so I think he's playing well, but I'm really intrigued by Matty Schmid. He's a player that I kind of track quite a lot on the PGA Tour. Spoiler alert, I'll probably be backing him in Mexico and places like that, Bermuda, as we go into that kind of swing on the PGA Tour. But um, he played well here last year, I believe. I think he was 24th. He definitely had a top 25. Yeah, 24th last year. Um, open was 66, closed was 65. And when you look at his results, Sky, they've been pretty consistent considering he's you know been here, there, and everywhere. 15th for the KLM Open, fifth going into the weekend. Uh, 52nd at the Rocking Board is not great, but he opened for 66 to be fourth. 32nd at the BMW International Open, did miss the cut. Um, I believe that was in Scotland. But then Barracuda made the cut. 12th at the 3M Open, 26th for the Olympics, obviously limited field. And then opened with 68, 67 at the Wyndham and just fell away. I. I think he's playing pretty strongly, and AK is is a good price. I think on someone of his upside. I think people like to click Manny Schmidt um, on the six Ks and PGA Tour, so I know um, you know he could be somebody that's comforting. And I don't disagree. The profile is a little bit different than what I what I like here, but again, at the price, you're getting that discount do, for him. Do you think though, on that point, and you're, you're pretty better placed to argue uh, answer this than me, but like. You say people are like clicking him at 6K and stuff, and that's what they see him at on the PGA Tour every week. When people start to see him at 8K, is it a, oh, that's a familiar name, I'm going to play him, or is that, oh, I don't want to pay 1500 more for him this week? Yeah, I mean, it could all be relative. I, it's either comfort of knowing who you're playing yeah. versus versus the other. I, I kind of think people like those that they've played on the PGA Tour when they're coming into these type of events more than are price sensitive. Yeah. But But he was also like, the thing at the Olympics is he might have finished 26, but he have a, had a bajillion birdies, was in the yeah. mix. Like, I think he had like eight or it got to like seven under early on like the Thursday at, at Leg Off National, which I didn't think was a course fit for him either. Um, and just shows he can pay off salary without even having a, a top end finish. So that's kind of safe because, because contrary to right next to it is my, my next betting selection, um, which if you really want to thread the needle of trying to get a golfer's first win since he's been on the DP world tour. And when it's not a new golfer to the DP world tour, we're getting tight here with Gavin green, but yeah. 
I mean, if I think through him, right, I mean, he hasn't missed a cut here. Three top 12s, eighth last year here. And what Gavin Green does is just go nuclear with the irons. That's just his game. And if he pairs that with a top end putter, he's he's in the mix, right? I mean, that is that is what it is. He's really in the mix when it comes to Thursdays. You know, he he's a great showdown play. He's a great first round leader type of play um, for that. But I think at 7,900, it probably won't get past people because he's played some pretty dang good golf this week, this year, but he's one of my favorite plays of the entire slate 60 to one to try to get that victory is what I'm shooting for here. So at 7,900, I'm in on Gavin green. Yeah. It wasn't someone I looked at really in terms of betting, but the more we kind of speak here, I've got space on my card and I don't mind it at all. Like it, he was, he was getting there with his form then he spikes, as you said last week, finishes ninth. And that course form really is ridiculous. Now, you know what I'm going to say. It's going to be the first round leader. He had a Saturday 63 on debut. He hit open 65 64 to lead after 36 holes in the second time around. Second round 65 on the third go around. That was after an opening 74. He had a final round 64 two years ago. Every year here, and then he led after round one with a 63 last year. Every year here, he shoots a 63 or 64. All that kind of all of that type of score. So I will be backing him at least first round leader, I think. Yeah. Um, I like it. I, I do like it. Uh, there, there's another I mean, without that... a name association, we would be all over it, right? We just don't yeah. trust Gavin Green to win. Yeah, but I guess... Places basically... are, will be pretty good, though, at six. Yeah, and I think every. I think everyone at this point now, we've got past the people we trust to win on the DVR Tour after we got out of the 10K, I think. So uh, maybe Thriston Lawrence, I guess. But... Um, yeah, we're definitely in can they win territory. I mean, Rosner's right next to him, 7,900. Great player, struggles to win. Alexander Bjork, 7,800. So, spoiler alert, I'm betting Alexander Bjork um, and playing him in drafting 7,800 because I think it's an out of sight, out of mind type approach of Alexander Bjork. We we just haven't, he hasn't been frittering across both tools or anything like that. He's He's been trying his best to play it out there on a PGA Tour. He did come back for the Scandinavian mix. When he did, he was third going into the final round, finished 12th. Um, but he's just really struggled. Like, he just puts himself under so much pressure off the tee that his approach play has just been god-awful. And um, it was really surprising when he made the cut of the PGA Championship and played really nicely with his irons there. And I just, with that kind of thought process, going into Scandinavian mixed, not played since the Lynx golf sort of stretch, I just think Alexander Bjork, this is the perfect golf course for him, as I said, right at the top of the show, Probably should have won here last year, arguably. Um, and he's got, what, like three more top 20s on top of the second and another 28th. Really good here. He missed one weekend when he withdrew after a 69. So um, I'm willing to take the shot on Bjork whilst we don't know kind of what we're getting. Um, if Do we it. know what, what he, where he's been? Like what's been going on? Like that's, that's a significant miss of time when... You are 167th in the FedEx Cup rankings, and maybe you just had no shot to get. I mean, you you do like you had a shot to get in the top 70 if you played well. If at the 3M, you didn't even have at the 3M at the Wyndham. Like the Wyndham probably should be like the most course fit for Alexander Bjork of the entire PGA Tour season. I was shocked he didn't play. Yeah, I mean he's Aaron Rye, right? Like he's the yeah. same type person. I don't know what he's doing, but. Whether that means there's an injury that we should be worried about, and that's what's kind of left. But I just think there's just a huge lack of confidence of doing anything on the PGA Tour. He's 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 had a go at it. He'll be back next year, and he'll be absolutely delighted to be back. Um, whereas someone like McIntyre is uncomfortable being out there for sort of mental reasons and just not want to be in America. Bjork just cannot play in America. Like it's just there's nothing about his game to translate. So um, I think he'll just benefit from coming back, and and I like him as golf course. Yeah. For sure. For sure. I think absolutely from a course fit makes a lot of sense. I really like Johannes Veerman, uh, 7,800. Um, didn't end up betting him again. I mean, he's probably right there for me with Gavin Green. I, I feel like his just comes um, with a little bit more inconsistency. I mean, on the year as a whole, right? Four or five top tens, you know, littered with, you know, 
top 40 or worse results throughout there. Last week, he was lights out off the tee, lights out with approach, finished high for 23rd while losing close to six strokes on the green, if not more. Uh, he was 10th when he came over to the States in the in the ISO championship, which was really strong for him. Um, only one time playing here, missed the cut. But I mean, I think at this price, I'm I'm pretty, pretty into what Johannes Veerman can do from an upside standpoint. Yeah, I like Veerman. Like he, he was definitely one that I looked at uh, in both perspectives. I think I'd rather play him than Yannick Paul currently. The, the one is Adrian Sadier. At right, you can go into Sadier. I think yeah. he's super close there too. So I was going to bet him. He went from 75 to 50s and I kind of decided against it. I, I think there's potentially limited winning upside on him. The form is really good and he seems to play well at this time of year consistently. He's played well in America a couple of times on that trip. We, uh, pair of weekend 65s last year finished 13th, 7th here three years ago. Uh, again, a third round 65 there. Got another top 25. Really loves the event. And then when you look at his obviously finishes of recent, 16th, 29th, 3rd and 5th, uh, really strong for Sadio. So that would be why I would probably go him over Veerman in this position. Um, but I think they're much for much just in terms of talent, probably, if anything, Veerman slightly better. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, if we talked, you know, guys who probably cannot play when it comes to American style courses, you mentioned Bjork. Andrea Pavan is another one that kind of fits that off the tee game is just irrelevant, even after getting overcoming the yips, but might set up extremely well at this type of, of course. You know, he's popped and played decent, was really good with the Irons last week. He could garner um, some interest there at 76. 600, yeah. Callum Hill, probably pretty safe with kind of the Connor Syme association I have with those guys, a uh, safe golfers in this range. The one that I'm going back to the well at triple digits with and at 7,500 is, I just think Henrik Norlander is just better than than what he should be, like in this range. You know what I mean? He's top 25-ing three consecutive PGA Tour events. Last week, he was pretty horrific off the tee. Irons were as good as what they were in America. He sorts that out or maybe gets the driver out of his hands a little bit more. Um, at a course like this where he can be iron off the tee, has never played here in the event before. But to me, I am uh, just willing to bet on the talent in what we saw come to fruition on the PGA tour at this type of level when he's priced like this. I just think with Norlander, people are underestimating what he's actually done in his career. And that's because he hasn't got all of the wins to his name, but this is a guy that's had, I think he's lost two playoffs on the PGA tour. He's obviously won a couple of times on the corn Ferry tour. You have to wonder if he was a player that was playing over here every every week, would he you know, win a bit more? I'm pretty confident to say that he would do. Um, so, yes, he's 37 years of age and, and hasn't necessarily achieved that much. But I think it goes overlooked just how difficult it is to stay relevant for that long in the cycle of players. And, and he's managed it. I mean, you look at the people he's lost to in playoffs. Mackenzie Hughes won the RSM. I think that was his first win. You know what he's done since. Billy Horshaw was also in that playoff. And then the the one last year, you know, Luke List won, but we had Luke Gobert in the playoff. So that's the caliber of player he's going up against. Um, and so I do think that Norlander is overlooked. And I would be a little bit gutted if he went on to win that wasn't on. So I think he's potentially the one that I might add at 100 to 1. Yeah, very, very intrigued for me there. If I, if I look anywhere else in sevens... By the way, Andre Pavard is not just a bad driver. He is the worst driver of the golf ball in the entire world. And I think that includes amateurs. Like, yeah, I think he's gained strokes with the driver like three times in his whole career. He is absolutely awful with the driver. I don't. It's actually testament to how good the rest of his game is that he can actually succeed on the tour because he is awful with the driver. Um, Andrea, if you're out there, I'm sorry, but you are literally horrendous. Um, talking of other players in the sevens, I don't know if we've given up on Rakira Hashino a little bit quickly. Um, I mean, right now, if it year ended, he has a PGA Tour card with some comfort. Yeah. And we obviously won on him at the Qatar Masters. That was after he'd, he'd finished the year with those two seconds only in Australia. It was 12th in Bahrain the week before. But he's been 10th at the KLM Open. Good iron play there. 6th at the BMW International Open. Good iron play there. As I keep sort of referencing, I don't necessarily mind when some of these players miss the cut back-to-back -back at the Open and the Scottish. If they play really well at the Scottish, they miss the Open or vice versa. 
I'd be a little bit more concerned, but they're just not linked to Colfords yet. They're not linked to Colfords. He hit his irons terribly last week, but I imagine that's pretty much an anomaly um, in terms of what he does. This feels like a better Hashino course based on what we've seen about him in the last couple of years. So I'd be tempted to give him a chance. I haven't bet him, but at 7,600, I think he's a good play. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's a good player too. And, and yeah. potentially, I think we were in on him when he won a little bit more because the distance heavy uh, yeah. side of things. So, I mean, maybe it's taken out of the bag a little bit more here. Um, but we'll be curious to see. And I think, I mean, at the price, of course. I mean, I think a lot of these 7K guys are, are good plays. Like, I could see myself very spread out in this range. Mentioned from the top really into Andrew Wilson, 7,400. He's, he's on my card at hundred to one to win this week. I mean, back to back really strong weeks after going into that PGA tour break off of two other top 20. So he went 10th, 20th, made the cut and his one PGA tour start where he was, I think fifth after the first round, um, that week open with a 65. Yes. And then 14th, ninth, I mean, just really good stretch of golf continuing debut here for him. But um, if he keeps this up, I mean, he seems to be the one at an odds price in 7,400 for me. That is my favorite um, in this lower seven case. Yeah, so I'm I, I was pretty high on Wilson yesterday on on our podcast. And I was slightly concerned that he couldn't win. But 110 to one, I'm going to play him and I'm going to join you with Henry Norlander at 100. So that kind of summarizes that with Wilson. There's a couple of players. Uh, this seven mid sevens range is actually really difficult to, put to sort of separate players because Andrew Johnston's playing some good golf again now. Um, you know Matt, who who came on our podcast yesterday to do the the DP World Tour, he sort of said, you know, there's a player that I've tracked and and what's he like here? He finished third here on his second start, opening and closing 65s there. 35th a couple of years later, 23rd. So he's been pretty solid at this golf course, even when he was 60th last time, he was 14th going into the weekend. It just seems to be out of nowhere. He's kind of got over those fitness issues, a little bit of the, uh, the mental health issues that he was having. Um, he was second going into the weekend at the Czech Masters, obviously rusty, third still going Sunday, finishes 23rd. Danish Golf Championship, 25th going into the final round, finishes 42nd, and then finishes 18th last week, pretty much getting better all week. So... But again, that progression I mentioned about I, with Rasmus earlier, I just want to see them get better throughout the week. That was the case with Johnston and um, just lending itself to, to a potentially good week. And then right next to him is Richie Ramsey, who loves this type of event. Um, this is right in uh, Richie Ramsey's wheelhouse. Um, you know, he has won the event. He's got two other top tens at the golf course playing OK as well. Uh, there's a really good case here, contrary to what we said about um, maybe going sort of like stacks across the gates and nines, that you can play some of the 10 gay guys because you can get these these players that we're going back and forth here in the seven guys. Yeah, 100%. I mean, another one super popular uh, in some of the outrights that I saw was Marcus Kinhall at 7,500 yep. flat too. 10th here as an amateur in 2015 is yet to miss a cut. Back to back top 25 finishes. Um, almost had one at that KLM Open when he, he lost in the playoff to Guido. Um, so I, I mean, there's there's a ton to really pick from, and I think you can be confident with a lot of them. If I'm going to go off the board, low 7Ks, Angel Aora, I, I still don't think, you know, with a challenge toward not having very much publicity, I mean, 19 years old, winning, you know, his first professional win last week is going to have a DP World Tour card, um, you know, popped up early on in the year, 21st in the Australian Open um, for him where he was awesome. I think we had bet him early on in the year. Uh, he was three of four, I think, of making the cuts in his DP World Tour starts. Um, five, Actually, four of five of making them. Now we get him in a price range that, you know, top 20 pays off immensely for him. And then right next to him is who we mentioned we want to be on his next start, and that's Jacob Skov Olsen, you know, um, at 7,200 for him, 13th in Wagger. Um, if you look at Data Golf's rankings of him, he's 15th. He was fifth at his home country Danish Golf Championship. Into the mix a little bit on that week after making the cut at the Open Championship. So as an amateur getting a spot start here again, I think he's somebody that we can get pretty different with with him and Aora compared to yeah. some of the guys that just are more, I guess a little bit more name recognition. But I think those two at 7,200, I love at the bottom there. So what I would say, based on what we've just been talking about with the kind of build, and what we've seen over here in the past, this is an event that really does go to the top guys. 
like as much as we've had a couple of shots with Soderbergh at the time, and uh, I think we've had one other that was, was quite Andres strong. Romero, right? Wasn't he pretty long here too? Yeah, yeah. and you've had David Lipsky's one. But generally speaking, um, yeah, Romero was, was runner up right to Soderbergh. But like last three years, Louis Aberg, Tristan Lawrence, Rasmus Oigard. We talked about all of those already. Sebastian Soderbergh, back to back of Matt Fitzpatrick after Alex Noren, Danny Willett, Thomas Bjorn a couple of times. Going, it's, it's a very much a who's who of the DP World Tour. So I think just pausing here at this point and saying, like, you, you've got those upside of of Olsen and Iora that we believe could be really high level talents. When we start getting into the six Ks, and we will obviously talk about them briefly, but like, I don't necessarily think this is a long shot week. I think this is very top heavy. Yes, we've got a bunch of those seven and a half K guys that we think could potentially win top 20, Andrew Wilson, Andrew Johnson, etc. But I think in terms of are we looking for this 6,300 guy that's going to come in and win? I don't think so. Yeah, and I think that's kind of started off from the top. Like, I'm yeah. not very intrigued. I love the 6Ks on the PGA Tour because then it makes you play the combinations of Scheffler yeah. and Xander together and all these different ones. And you obviously have a little bit more trust in bigger events of those guys, especially as of late. But yeah, when you get into the 6Ks, I think there's some some one-offs that are, that are okay, but... It's not nearly the same the same comfort level. Um, I don't think I'm just scrolling through the six case now, and I don't think there's a single player that I'd feel comfortable touting as like a potential top twenty guy. There, there's I got gonna, I got one. I've got maybe one at, at six nine or two, maybe at six nine, but get right down the bottom, I'm struggling. So I I think it's really important to note there that you can build those teams without going this far down. Is is quite key, I think. Um, 7,100 also, Max Rotliff, uh, after being on him recently, he did uh, top 10 last week. It's been weird with his game. He was lights out approach when he was in the States and then hasn't repeated that, but he's been really good with the putter, was really good off the tee last week. So if he can kind of combine to that, I mean, he's got some some upside there at 7,100, but I, I'm comfortable chatting into the, into with the couple we like at the 6Ks if you're you're good with that. Yeah, just just one more point I wanted to make. Seven to two hundred. Already already won with Nacho Alvira this season. But he's just a player that just plays well where he can play well, and it's as simple as that. Now he was pretty poor with his approach play last week uh, in or two weeks ago in Denmark. But um, you look at his course form here: twentieth, fourth, thirteenth, and ninth amongst you know three missed cuts on the fifty ninth. I think that's really impressive. So for a player that we know has turned up this year when the course is suited. He's obviously won Sadao, seventh at the Scandi Mix, second in Kenya, third at Qatar Masters. Um, yes, you're looking at a player that's made, missed four of his last five cuts, um, but the 28th at the Czech Masters is fine, and it's all coming off a, a recent win. So I think there's some upside there in Simmons too. But yes, let's go into the sixth case. Guy. Um, only other one, uh, buyer beware again, Sean Crocker withdrew last week pre-tournament. I'm not sure if it's injury related or not. I did um, see I, that Crocker got, he got engaged um, after the open championship recently. So maybe on just an extended life, um, you know, vacation of, of PJ tour or, or DP world tour golf. But I mean, he did battle with some injuries prior to, but he made the cut at the open. Yeah. I think he was injured. I'm sure I've read something about his injury, but again, we've, we've had this kind of conversation with Sean Crocker in the past that like, I think we know he enjoys the good life and, and is, you know, potentially quite chilled out in terms of, you know, practice and things like that. So um, I would just be worried about motivation factor right now. Right. I mean, like Saturday at the Open, right, he shot a 69, and, and that was, you know, pretty pretty dang strong for, for him, yeah. top 10 in the field that day. Um, but, okay, so before we go into the 6Ks, I um, just want to make sure we give a shout-out to our audio listeners. You can find us on Daily Fantasy Sports Picks and Bets. The Mix, appreciate the love on there. It was great getting back in the swing of it last week with you, Tom. Huge September for the DP World Tour. We know NFL is kicking off. Pat's got a bunch of shows. I was listening to him, Pizzola, Cam, Cust. Uh, and Jeff this past week on the NFL Total Show, which is always a fun draft show. I love listening to those guys every week. Um, so, so much on the Mayo Media Network as football kicks off here in the States. But again, hot time for European golf as we close out the year and some of our favorite events overall. So Tom and I will be at it. Um, so we appreciate the support by leaving comments, rate reviewing and subscribing across the podcast platform as well as YouTube. So thank you for that. 6Ks, you said you got a couple at 6,900. Who are they? Yeah, Jeff Winter uh, is a player that 
The golf course should suit, and it hasn't yet, which is potentially a concern. Uh, when you look at the kind of performances he's put in here, they've been pretty uninspiring. Withdraw, missed cut, 40th, 29, missed cut. But when he was 29th, he, he had two rounds of 67 and 66. I thought that was pretty impressive. Four sub-70s there. Um, he He's shown life a couple of times. When you look at his approach play, it's been pretty decent over the last two starts, 8th and 12th. So I think it's worth kind of keeping in mind. But the one I think really caught my eye is Lucas Nemitz, who I, I still don't know really what he is. Like, I, I, don't, I can't really pinpoint him, but his approach play looks solid right now. When he's made the cut 11th, 23rd, 28th, 45th, 8th and 22nd, I know we might have slightly different data on that, Sky, but generally speaking, he's playing pretty well. Tee screen again, strong. Um, so from what he's shown there, the fact that on debut here, he was 19th past round one, 12th going into the weekend, and then shot a pair of 72s and finished 62, uh, 62nd, I thought was quite actually eye-catching because you look at 67 missed cut in his course form and go, OK, well, he doesn't play very well here, but really good for the first two days. Then last year, he opens up with 68, uh, shoots 74, misses a cut. Just the way he's playing, like 27th, 45th, 13th, 28th, 19th, and his last five starts, 27th for the BMW International Open. He was 8th going into the weekend. 45th for the Isco in America. He was 15th going into the weekend. 13th for the Barracuda. He was actually 10th in the stroke play scoring. 12th going into the final round of Czech Masters. Finished 28th and then 19th last time out. Um, getting better every day at the Danish. Um, just looks like he's in a really good patch of form. And because he's shown that first couple of rounds here two years ago on debut, I think he's an interesting player at 69. Yeah, Nemix definitely has has popped in some of that that fashion when looking through it. For me, the the one um, that I think has the upside that could maybe do do a little bit of a shocker um, at, at this event is Tai Chi Ko at sixty, I believe he's sixty six hundred um, officially. So Tai Chi is twenty three years old. Plays primarily out of the Asian tour. Um, again, kind of a limited amount of starts this year as he just turned professional uh, in 2023, where he was on the Asian tour, uh, had won at his home course early on uh, in the Asian tour, followed up with multiple top 10 finishes that year. I believe he had five in total that year. Um, and then 2024 really had been a sleeper until the last five events for him. Eighth. Now that's at the Asian uh, or the All Thailand Tour, excuse me, and then four consecutive finishes of T13, T13, T10, T13 on the Asian Tour. Now, I'm betting him to win at at 40 or 400 to one. Primarily, though, I want that top 10, top 10, 20 on him when I look through um, kind of his profile. But he was somebody that was pretty decent as an amateur, um, you know, when we when we kind of build in there. And I I know Brad. Um, and our friend Michael Golf, who I want to give a shout out, you know, Brad's had a successful launch on Patreon. Our friend Michael recently went on Patreon as well as he's been a very quality tipster for multiple years for free on Twitter. So always love to support those that are kind of going on their, their venture for that. But both of those guys hit Tai Chi Ko at like 500 to one in that Asian tour event on his home course when he pretty much dominated as I think 21 year old. Um, so I just think the upside is in there and at, at 6,600 um, in his current form, I, I like it quite a bit uh, for a, you know, a, a very low owned play. Yeah, for sure. Like people are just, you talk about comfortability facts of people who have periods or people just don't know him. Like I don't know a ton about him. I know from speaking with Brad and, and yourself that uh, a bit about him, but really don't know too much about his game. So if I don't, then, you know, the casual players are really not going to know, are they? So um that would be one thing I'd say there. Oliver Wilson is the same price. He's shown a little bit of form. I'm um, not going to get too into the weeds of Oliver Wilson because it's dangerous for me, but um, he, he is playing pretty decent. He's a golf course that he does like. But I think after that, it's slim pickers. I've seen a lot of people talk about Sam Jones, Sky, which I thought you might be interested in. Um, the I, thing I is, I, I'm so... I think as like his game... Yeah. It's scaring me because I follow on Instagram and he posts like his strokes gain from his like practice rounds and he, they aren't good. Like he's showing, like, he's like really struggling with irons, um, like really struggling, like in like chipping. And then he's like the best first round leader play 
of like all time. Like he opened the 67th Danish golf championship. And then last week at the British masters, I'm pretty sure he was like two, three under through like six or seven holes, looked on his way to posting a big score. Did miss the cut last week, but I mean, I think you probably have to stick with these guys. And normally I'm just so hot or cold trying to pick between Nicholas Galetti Jones, like who's right. I think at, at this time I'm okay with skipping them all and think their talent long-term. I just hope they keep their cards, you know, and we can bet on them and see them in a longer sample size. Um, but I'm okay. Probably not being as interested in Jones this week. Yeah. The, the two players, I think just from a spike performance perspective, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? Um, Adrian Aus has got two top tens here, sixth and ninth. And when you look at his kind of recent form, it's either great or terrible. He's got a fifth um, at the Italian Open, I think it was, and then 12th at the Czech Masters, where he was actually higher placed, I think, earlier in the week, 25th going back to the European Open. So he's got some good starts. Um, and then the other one is Renato Paratori. absolutely loves his golf course, but he's playing like one of the worst players on tour. So it's hard to really know what to do. But even last, like last four years, 12th, 7th, 29th and 13th here. And I imagine probably in quite comparable form, he's not someone that's been very good for a while now. So um, if you want just someone that can spike at his golf course, I think Renato Paratore is, is that player. But well, what was interesting to me about Renato, I'm trying to pull this up as we speak. <laughs> He was fifth in strokes gained approach on Friday. He opened with an 82, and then he shot a 70 in round two. I don't think he putted it very well, but I think his like ball striking was kind of close to what we've seen out of Renato in this type of course fit. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think he's somebody who is just putrid off the tee as well. Yeah. Um, you know, so he could, on this style of course, I would be way more into him than than at any like bigger track and you're right i mean his history here is great why can't italian people hit the driver oh, like I mean. wasn't that like what francesco Molinari typically struggled with a little bit before he found his game and was essentially gonna be the best player in the world but one still it was like 270 yards and right down the middle yeah you know, it wasn't like, like he i he, would take that but yeah these guys aren't even doing that they're not even no, hitting the fairway and hitting it 250 they're, yeah they're 270 into the trees and You've got Pavan, Paratore, Manasero lost his whole career from not being able to hit driver. The, how can it, how can it be a whole nation? Like, tell me one Italian player is great at driving a golf ball. There isn't one. No, Guido's finally like coming around to yeah, being yeah. better. <laughs> so he he's can, being yeah. better with it. But this yeah. is like the first year in multiple years. I mean, he had lost that completely. Yeah. Um. You know. So. Whereas like Danish people, know. like could just pound it and they're just yeah. great. I mean, they're obviously like Nordic or Viking or whatever, but like, what, like, what is there about Italy? They're they just too laid back. To, I don't know. Like, what is it? I guess, yeah, man. Because they carb load, they eat so much pasta and pizza. You think they'd smash it down the middle? I mean, for sure. Yeah, strange. For sure, huh? Well, we got an hour, Tom. Um, a yeah, we, little bit over that. I think this is in depth preview through a lot of the golfers. I know you talked with Matt yesterday on Lost for Words, too, yeah. if people are looking for additional. But this is the type of week 20K for the DP World Tour, a top prize. That's, that's you know, something I'm definitely going after and I want to take advantage. And hopefully, we can fill these contests to you know kind of get them for Wentworth, which would be the, the really big opportunity. Last year in one of the DP World Tour events, it was 100K to first. So we could use that for Wentworth if we if we fill this type of week. I mean, they didn't post the contest till this morning or this afternoon, pretty much, yeah. for the DP World Tour. So let's be vocal in filling it. Let's be vocal in advance of Wentworth because I love getting uh, more eyeballs on the DP World Tour, especially at some of the best tracks that we have. So with that being said, Tom, do you want to review your betting card for us? Yes, so I'm back in Rasmus Hoygaard at 18 to 1, Alex Fitzpatrick at 40 to 1, Alexander Bjork at 66 to 1, and then I'm joining you on Henrik Norlander at 100 to 1, and Andrew Wilson at 110 to 1. Yep, so I have Alex Fitzpatrick with you, 40s. I like Gavin Green, who you said you're going to go with the first round leader yeah. option. I like Gavin Green at 60s. Andrew Wilson, 100 to 1 over here in the States. Henrik Norlander, 100. And then long shot Tai Chi Ko, 400 to 1 with a top 10 and top 20 in that for the week. So that'll put a bow on it for us, Tom. Appreciate you as always. What's on deck next week for us? Is it the. Right, is it the Irish next week? I think it's the Irish, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Irish right. at Royal County Down, uh, which will be awesome. 
um, next week, and then I believe it's right into Wentworth the following week, right? Yeah, so Wentworth, interesting one. I tr- potentially go. I've got the Friday off of work, um, so I might try and go set on the Friday. Really good field. Like if anyone's kind of looking for one of the more exciting fields in the next kind of months or so, that's one of the best. Like Zalatoris is playing, Horschel's playing, Adam Scott's playing, Justin Rose, Rory, all, all these guys are coming over for that. So um, don't know if we're getting any of the live guys yet or not. I imagine potentially not with it being the, the flagship event, but um, always a good event, always a good field. Uh, and as you said, probably the biggest prize pool we're going to get. So mark that for a couple of weeks time. Royal Countdown should be amazing. And then it's just been a, it's a really good run of, I'm so glad you're back Sky because, you know, Spanish Open, Dunhill Links, Open to France. We know what we like about the Golf National. Um, and this year is not at uh, Valderrama anymore, but still an exciting event. So, and then it goes right into the kind of playoff event. So yep. it's going to be a yep. really good end to the season. And Q School has started. It's I mean, it's hard to find or even like pay attention to, but yeah. first stage has started. I think it's the second week is going on right now. I'll give a shout out to Bear Off. He, he always listens to us and this is an hour and five minutes in. So if he's still listening and awake, I appreciate you, Bear Off. But we're on Aman Gupta, who made it through the first stage. He's 500 to one on the challenge tour this week. So there's a little sneaky tip too, that we found from old man Aman Gupta uh, for us there to, to kind of put a bow on the long shot week there. I like it. I uh, I did notice a player. I can't remember whose name it was. I noticed it was at the top one of those. I need to go back and have a look at that. But um, there's some exciting players. I mean, Brad up. tips it, you know, so it kind of gets my eyes there. Um, for it so I'm, I'm always intrigued uh q school because again a lot of these guys were in q school last year that have now made their way um, into the mix and a lot of things so all right with that we'll put a close to it thank you guys as always we'll catch you next week for the irish open thanks so much thanks guys